Welcome to Wine for Normal People, the podcast for people who like wine, but not the snobbery that goes with it. I'm your host, Elizabeth Schneider, author of the Wine for Normal People book and certified wine dork. And I'm MC Ice, just a wine-loving normal person. This podcast is sponsored by Wine Access Wine. A-C-C-E-S-S dot com slash normal is how you will get lots of wow moments from the wine club shipment that I select. Your fellow wine lovers have discovered the wine club and are loving it. You don't want to miss out. WineAccess.com slash normal. Listen in the middle of the show for more details. Comte is an ancient cooked and pressed cheese that's made from raw milk. Comte is made in the Jura Massif of France. We may recognize that from wine. It's a region of medium elevation mountains that covers the department of the Jura and the Dobe in Bourgogne, Franche, Comte region. We are going to talk about the special breed of cows that make the cheese from the 2,400 small dairy farms. Comte is made by people. It is not made in factories. It is very high quality. You don't have to believe me. Know that Comte is the highest consumed PDO cheese in France. Yes, like wine, cheese has an AOC PDO system. And Comte's overlaps with the wine region of the Jura. I'd love to welcome Communications Director for Comte, Aurelia Chimier, and Jean-Louis Carbonier, a very good friend of mine who I've known for so many years. He does communications for Comte in the U.S., among a lot of other clients, and he's been on the show before talking about Bordeaux. Welcome to you both. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you. Thank you for your invitation. It's a pleasure. Well, the audience really does love Comte, and it's always fun to have something besides just wine on the show, and this is so close to it in so many ways. So Comte has been made for more than a millennium. Can you give us a brief history of Comte so we can understand why it is so significant? Back in the Middle Ages, the long and harsh mountain winters prompted farmers to pool their milk supplies together and transform it into large waste of cheese that could meet the needs of family during the entire cold season. That is the very beginning. And they form the basis of the original cooperative system, which has become the backbone and singularity of the Comté still today. So how do you think that they decided to cook the cheese? We'll talk about the process, but how did they come up with this technique? Do you think that it was part of pooling together all of their ideas? Do we have any evidence of that? I know there's like Latin texts and things like that. Well, I I couldn't tell you exactly what gives a, the first idea of cooking the milk and keeping it that way for the winter, but I'm sure that uh, together they found the solution to be able to nourish all the family during the long winter and making hard pressed and cooked cheese was the very solution for that. And this is very unique to this particular area. There were other cooked cheeses, but already by the 1200s, there were people talking about how good the cheese was, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, the cooperative system uh, goes back to the uh, 12th century, uh, but we assume that Conte was made also before than that. It was a, a way of keeping milk for a long time. When it started to take off around France was after the railway system, which is interesting because that's, again, how a lot of the wine regions also wound up getting popularized. When we look at the 1800s, it looks like Comte started to become the defining thing of the region. So was there marketing or was it just the flavor? Why did it become so popular? We know that in the ancient time, some Comte wheels went directly to Roma to feed as well the population. So Comte is also a good cheese to be kept for a long time. So they could have that and keep it on boat, for example. Oh, yeah. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. To tra- it's, it's a very good way to travel with Comte. So that's also some facts that made it popular cheese even in the past. As far back as the 18th century and maybe before, you have these um, merchants who are, you know, traveling, they're peddlers, and they start m- taking Comté with them because, as Aurelia said, it's a very sturdy cheese. It keeps a long time. It's very robust. And I think then the army started to adopt Comté 
Um, there must have been Conte that went as far as Moscow with Napoleon. Wow. You know, and so I would imagine that, you know, that contributed to the part that Conte has played in, uh, you know, the French history of cheese. How did it become such a popular cheese in France? It's on every cheese plate, whether it's in Bordeaux or in Champagne or anywhere, everyone serves it. It's, it's like the one cheese that you always know you're going to get served, which is great. Is it the legacy or is it that it keeps well or is it just that people really enjoy the flavors, which is absolutely the case too? I would say for all these reasons, Conte has a great diversity of aromas, which make it very well at any moments of the day or at any ages, any affinage. It goes well for all family, from children to more aged people and uh, and people who like pairing with wine, who like cooking. Uh, you can do many, many things with, uh, with Conte. It keeps well, it travels well, it's a natural cheese. And I think people are really confident because of the PDO system, because of the rules of production that make it a great cheese also to eat, to enjoy and to share with in many ways. I think there's a special relationship between uh, especially French people and Conte in the sense that there's a certain, I would say, trust. Conte has remained, uh, you know, made in a very sp special region. Um, there are traditions, there is uh, all sorts of uh, know-how and skills, and it speaks to the French. And the, the product is just delicious. So uh, how could anyone resist? It's really hard to resist. Yeah, and it's not like a poix where... It can be very, very off-putting to many people. It's neutral enough so that it's got a lot of appeal. So what I want to talk about is the thing that's so appealing to me in, in talking to you is how many parallels there are between Comte and wine. And I think that talking about the terroir is not something that most people think about when they think about cheese, but it is a huge part of how Comte is made. And I would love to hear first about the cows, the special cows that you use, what makes them special. And then we'll talk about the land and all of the separate and special things that add to the terroir that make this cheese, which I think as people hear this, they're going to say, oh, wow, cheese is also something that people talk about terroir. The milk used to produce Conte comes from two very specific uh, breeds of cows. It's the Montbéliard cows and uh, the French Simmental. And those two breeds are two local breeds that are particularly suited uh, to the region's terrain and climate. So um, they are not very productive, but um, they have a, a, a lot of protein in their milk that is good for cheese making. Ah, that's interesting. So these are cows that are native to this area? They are native to this area, yes. Are they found anywhere else? Today, you can find Montbéliard cows everywhere in the world, but the biggest part of the breed still remains in Bourgogne-Franche-Comté. So it takes 100 gallons of milk to make a wheel of Comté, 20 cows to make one wheel. Can you talk about their diet? Because I know that is a huge part of how milk tastes and how the cheese tastes and the fact that there's no GMO in the diet. I think people these days especially are so worried about what's going into their food. It's exactly what you said, Jean-Louis, that people want some confidence that what they're having is not genetically modified or nothing that's weird. They prefer natural food, that kind of thing. So what do the cows eat? And can you talk about specifically what they're not allowed to eat? Because I think that's a big part of why this cheese can, maintains its quality. Yes, a uh, uh, cow produces about 20 liters of milk daily. And the milking takes place twice a day, every morning and every evening. Um, the milk robots are, for, are forbidden because uh, we want the milk producers to keep an eye on each cow to see if everything is going well. The Montbéliard cow produce raw milk for the making of 
Conte, so we need to be very, very careful on the quality of the milk. And um, the quality of the milk is also given by what the cows are eating. In the summer, they are grazing outside in the pastures. And in the winter, they eat the hay that has been harvested on the farm. And they are uh, staying in the stable because the winter in the area is quite harsh. They only eat native foliage. They eat grass, hay, fodder, and a small quantity of cereals to complete the feeding. No GMOs and no fermented food are allowed. What does fermented food do to milk? Does it make it taste funny? We don't want um, our cows to eat silage because it could give some special taste to the raw milk, and that wouldn't be good for the production of Comté. Is there a code of treating the cows humanely? Is That's, again, something that I think people are concerned about. The relationship between the cow and the milk producer is very important. They really take care of the cows. The animal welfare is very something Thing that uh, is a, uh, an important point for us, yes. Your listeners may not realize, you know, that the farms are generally small to medium-sized farms, which means that on average, you know, the, it's about, I think, about 40 or 50 cows per farm. Wow. So it's a very small number compared to what we see in other parts of the world. So it really makes it possible for the farmer. And I mean, it's integral to this, this model that the farmer is in constant contact with the animals. And if you visit, you will see that many farmers know their animals by name, all of them. It's very nice. I mean, it's, it's how you get the most out of your employees, right? <laughs> Treat them well. It's interesting because, again, I see this parallel with wine, that a lot of the best vignerons also have a relationship and they know the blocks and they know which vines give them problems and which ones need more and what to do. And I think that really good farmers tend to have a relationship with whatever they're farming, which is why... I really don't like the large scale farming because I don't feel like once you get to a certain size, you don't have that opportunity to really have the relationship with whatever you're farming. And at that point, it's impossible to care for it. But especially with animals, which have personalities and can either produce or not produce and be stubborn and all of that kind of stuff, I think it's probably very, very important. So what about the Jura? I've got to tell you, I just did a survey of what region do people really want to explore more in terms of wine. I think the number one that people said they were interested in looking more into was Jura. I was really surprised. I was excited by that. But I think that people are very interested in the overall lay of the land. This is an intriguing area from a wine perspective there's some very, very fascinating reds. Can you just describe to us what it looks like there and what is the lay of the land? You've already said, obviously, very cold winters. It's a continental climate, warm summers, probably fairly short summers because the days start to get shorter towards the end of August. Then you've got hills and mountains. Can you describe what it's like and what's the delimited area for Comte also? The region is characterized by a range of medium elevation mountains formed during the Jurassic era. The elevation varies from 200 meters to 1,700 meters with an alternance of grazing areas and forest, half of which is spruce, spruce uh, used for aging cellars. The specific geographic and uh, climatic condition of the area make it a, a very favorable for the production of, of quality grass, so perfect for producing milk. It's very nice and natural country. But it changes also over the year. And I did a podcast years ago with a woman who was a cheese master. And she talked about, she was just talking about generally cheese. And I never thought about this, but 
I think it's an important point to bring up again that the cows are going to produce different flavors of milk depending on what they're eating throughout the year. Can you talk about that? Seasonality has a big impact on the feeding since we are on natural feeding. During the summer season, it's about seven to nine months in the year. The cow is grazing outside and she eats about 60 to 100 kilos of grass and herbs. And in these herbs during springs and summer, you can find a, a lot of different plant species that will contribute to the diversity of aromas in the milk and then in the future Comté. So we can expect if we have the Comté from summer that we might get more herbal notes out of the cheese? Mm -hmm. Actually, the final taste of the Comté cheese is depending on so many factors that it's quite difficult to attribute one specifically to the species you will find in the grass or the know of the cheesemaker. There is also the way to mature the cheese, the time of affinage, many, many things. But uh, you will find different flavors from winter to summer. So it's not so much like in Chevre, you, you can really taste a big difference. You can tell that there's mm -hmm. a a big difference. This is a lot different because there's many different parts of the production process that's more involved, which we'll talk about in a second. I just want to ask a couple more questions about the PDO, the protected designation of origin. Is it set up in the same way that wine is? Wine, we've got very set production rules. We have historical importance and it, things have to be delimited and they have to be different from one another. There are very strict rules about production and yield and all of that kind of stuff. When was the PDO system set up for cheese? And is there a tasting panel for typicity? I mean, is it the same thing as wine? I don't know whether Jean-Louis, because you work on both sides of it, maybe you want to talk about that. Well, I think Aurelia knows more than me on this. Okay, yeah. But I think what's, uh, what, what I can just say as an introduction is to point out that, first of all, a PDO system are, are a set of specifications that are basically grounded in the history of the cheese, of Comté in this case. And part of this history is the very specific area of production. This is where Comté has been made for hundreds of years. It's not arbitrary. And then everything else has been fine-tuned over time, and the specifications codify these all these practices, which doesn't mean they cannot evolve, but it's the reflection of what happens on the ground. It's the reflection of what the different actors of the Comté sector, if you will, um, want it to be, want these specifications to be. Well, the reason I'm asking you specifically is because you also work in wine, not not because you know more about the Comte PDO. But, you know, when you look at Comte and then you look at Poliac or what's changing, you know, there, for instance, let's take Madoc right now. So they're thinking about adding a white to Madoc, Madoc Blanc. Wine right now, because of climate change, is a bit in flux. The producers are making some changes, but the way that wine is set up, it's similar to what you're saying, but I think it's so steeped in tradition that it's hard to move it's sometimes. And the expectation is that everything has to fit into a mold. Like Polyak has to taste like that. I guess what I'm saying is when we think about the PDO system for wine, is it more flexible for cheese or is it the same exact thing? I think one difference here is that there are very few wine PDOs that are very similar to Comte PDO in the sense that for the entire region, there's only one PDO, Comte. It's like champagne. You have one right. PDO of cognac, champagne, cognac, and everybody who's involved makes champagne, cognac, Comte. Having said that, I think what's important is that just as, as they've done in Champagne, when they, you know, they decided to revise the boundaries of the Champagne region years ago. So these are factors of change. Or in Champagne, I think they are, they are looking at, at new, uh, pruning methods and so on. So in, with Comte, for example, robots cannot be used. Historically, robots were not in the specifications of Comte because they did not exist. Right. Then they started to appear. So 
everybody involved in making Conte had to discuss among themselves was, is it a good thing for us or is it not a good thing? Is it going to, to allow us to continue uh, making Conte in the same spirit as we have done before? Or is it going to alter something in the spirit? And is the robot going to um, uh, interfere with the contact that the farmers have with their cows, etc.? Eventually, they decided that robots, as of now, were not a good thing, and therefore the specifications evolved to prevent the use of these robots. On the other hand, robots are used in the cellars to clean the cheeses, you know, and, and so on, in the ripening process of the cheeses, the maintenance of the cheeses. These are used because collectively the producers felt that the robot essentially duplicated what workers used to do. And in fact, it allevi- all, um, alleviates yeah, the, the, the load for the workers because carrying moving wheels that are, that are 80 pounds of weight all day long, it's very challenging. Yeah, they needed to get that from wine. We've got all of our forklifts. Did the PDO system for cheese start after wine or was wine the first one to codify things? Wine was 1936 in France. That's when the AOC started. I think it's about the time it started for cheeses as well. Some cheeses can be recognized before, but just for the, the area. So it was recognized by law, but not as a AOC system or later an AOP system. Like for Conte, the area has been recognized in 1952, but the Conte obtained the AOC in 1958 and then the European recognition in uh, 1996. Right. The idea of PDO began around 1936, as you said, yes. So before we get into the production methods, I just want to ask one more thing about the crew. There are some crew for Comte. There's some sites that are recognized as better or different than others inside of the region. They haven't been codified. So Jean-Louis, you were saying it's sort of like Champagne, but we do know there's some sites inside of Champagne that are certainly better than others. And they are called out, some of the towns. So is that something that would ever become codified? And how do we know that those specific sites are better? What's the crew system, the informal crew system? We can't really say we have crew system. What we want to say behind the crew is that um, there there is a a big diversity of aromas, of texture, depending on the place where the Conte is made. We have uh, 140 fritières making the cheese, transforming the milk into cheese. Every day, the milk is different. So every day, the wheels at the end will be different from each fritière, but also in the same fritière, from two different uh, cauldron, the wheels will be slightly different. When we co- when we say crew, is that we have a rules, a very important rule in the Conte specification, saying that uh, the fritière and the producers that give their milk to the fritière have to be in a circle. Uh, limited in a diameter of 25 kilometers. Mm -hmm. I don't know the conversion, but it means that they are from the same terroir. The milk comes from the same terroir. That would be a crew protecting the place. I think it's the same as wine. If you want a certain quality or looking for certain qualities, they have to come from one particular area. All right, let's talk about the production. So what is a fruitier and how many farms are going to contribute to each? How does each of them decide? Is it just regional or do they pick who they get to work with? And let's start out with the definition of what it is first, though. Well, the fritière is a place where uh, the milk producers pull their milk together and give the fruit of their labor through cheese making. So it's a, it's a cooperative system. The fritière is owned by the milk producers mainly, and they hire the cheesemaker. It's an original system that preserves milk producers 
fruitière, the old way of making comté. The word fruitière means to fructify. So that's the that's the really the crux of the system. You know, is the farmers coming together because each farmer only has a little bit of milk, at least historically. Then by pulling together, they have more milk. They can make a bigger cheese. They can fructify all their efforts. You know, they can transform the milk into something that's more valuable than the milk of any one farmer. Every week I tell you about how great wine access is, but let me give you some feedback directly from people who have tasted some of the wines that are in the Wine for Normal People Wine Access Wine Club. Here's a couple of things. I'm drinking the O2 Sauvignon Blanc tonight, and it's tremendous. It really, really does it for me. So far, we've had one of the wines, and we are in love. The whole shipment has me stoked. The GLF wine paired with Brie, wow, just wow. These are the kinds of things that people are saying about the Wine Access Wine Club. These wines are all hand-selected by me. Every single wine, when you go to wineaccess.com slash normal and sign up for the wine club, you are going to have these kinds of experiences where you're tasting these wines and are completely wowed by them. When you buy wines from a place that really cares, wines that are curated from around the world by a credentialed team, and then for the wine club, they're further vetted by me, or you can go on the wineaccess.com slash WFMP page, where again, I have hand-selected all of those wines. The wine is often available to repurchase. It's like a collection of their greatest hits, plus they always have new wines. Free shipping is included when you spend $150. You have up to 30 days to reach that $150 free shipping threshold. Listen to your fellow normal wine people, wineaccess.com slash WFMP or wineaccess.com slash normal is how you will get 10% off your first order. Wineaccess.com slash normal, wineaccess.com slash WFMP to see my picks, 10% off your first order. Also, Patreon. Patreon.com slash wine for normal people is how you will also get a tasting of those wine club wines. That's what I do for the patrons. I spend most of my time answering patron questions, doing patron hangouts. We just did a survey about what the patrons want. I try to give more and more value all the time. It is the community that's kept this podcast going. The support of the listeners is how we really exist and how we improve the podcast and keep going and keep keep coming up with all these new ideas and new people to talk to. Patreon.com slash Wine for Normal People is a fantastic community that you're going to get so much out of. We really appreciate your support. And WineForNormalPeople.com slash classes. How to get better wines out of California is coming up. Make sure you get on that class. Lots of insider information that you're going to want to see. Tuscany, right after I come back from that trip. And it is in all time zones, European and in U.S. time zones, Canadian time zones. So get on it today. And while you're enjoying those wines... For those classes, you can eat some fantastic Comté. So now let's get back to the show and hear more about Comté cheese, which has striking similarities to wine. I'm just going to draw it back to wine. You know, we've had a lot of problems with co-ops and quality in wine, but it does not seem like that's an issue here. When we look at co-ops, you know, in wine, and Aurelia, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but a lot of times when we see co-op in wine, that's oftentimes a very negative connotation behind it. They're getting better, but a lot of times the co-ops have been responsible for some of the worst (laughs) wines in regions possible. But it seems like here, without it, you could not do the system. So I think that when people hear that word who are listening, they just need to know that it's a very different situation. Cooperatives, especially for dairies, are incredibly important for the survival of the individual farmers because they don't have, we're not talking about one being worse quality or better quality. It's that they don't have enough to be able to sell things together, which is the same idea behind grape co-ops. It's just that they got kind of lazy and things went downhill pretty fast in like the 60s and 70s, you know? Well, the size of the fruitier, you know, is also very limited. They don't have hundreds of farmers in one fruitier. So that also contributes to the quality of the system. And also, I think another strong element is that 
everybody is interconnected, whether it's the farmer, the cheesemaker and the production of the cheese and the affiner who's going to age the cheese. So it's in everybody's interest and necessary that everyone is really making the best they can do so that at the end, the resulting Comté is the best cheese they can make. And that benefits for everyone. Yes, it would be nice if wine also thought of it that way, but they don't, as you know. <laughs> All right, let's talk about what happens because, I mean, this really goes right into the production process. It is a tight timeline to get the cheese made because they only have 24 hours to get the milk into a process. Can you talk about the cheese making process, Aurelia? Yes, sure. There are various stages in the in the milking transformation. First, the milk arrives from the farms around the fruitière, and uh, the cheesemaker pour the milk in copper vat. This is in the specification to use copper vat. They pour the milk in it, they heat the milk, and then they pour rennet to start the milk to curdle. And then when the desired texture is obtained, the cheesemaker will begin, we call that cutting the curd. He uses his hand to check the proper graininess at this moment. And then when it's ready, the content of the vat goes into mold to form a white wheels, a very, very a baby conté. But they wouldn't sell that, right? No, no, you can't sell that now. It has almost no taste. <laughs> it's very elastic. So it needs to go in the in an aging cellar to take texture and to take taste. So it's not really that many steps to the process, is there? You do the curdling and then you cut the cheese and you ripen it a bit, and then you've got to mature it. Maturing is really the big part of the process of Comte. You also have to press it. I don't know if you said that. No. Uh, Isabel. What is the pressing process? Can you talk about that? I'm not sure. I don't think I know what that is. I've watched them make, separate the curds and do all of that, but I've never seen pressing before. What is that process? After the curds are in the mold, we pour the curd in perforated molds that allows the whey to drain while keeping the curd. And then the cheesemaker puts the green plates uh, that identifies the cheese. And then he, he puts the mold under 350 kilos of press and it, it remains it for 20 hours to be pressed correctly. And then uh, the day after, the cheese, which is called Comté en blanc, Comté in white, uh, is unmolded and salted. When you're saying it's molded, you mean it's turned into a wheel? Is that what we're looking for? We're looking to get it into the form where we can then age it. You know, like yes. when we go to the store and we see those giant wheels, that's the pressing. And you want to mm -hmm. press a lot of it because this is a hard cheese, so you want to get as much together as possible. You wouldn't press a soft cheese, right? Well, there's more to it because I think what the pressing does is to um, remove a lot of liquid, a lot of water, a lot, you know, where as it were, but a lot of liquid from from the cheese. So it it's the pre the pressing removes the liquid, but also creates more cohesion between the grains of curds. So if you did not remove water, you would be making a very large camembert, you know? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you could not keep for months and months and months. So part of the principle and the ageability of the cheese relies on um, the acidity of the curd, but also on the low level or lower level of moisture inside the cheese. Okay, so the way you get the moisture out of a semi-hard to hard cheese is through this pressing process is what you're saying. So you can make any cheese you want, but if you want to make a cheese that's hard, that's going to be able to travel and age and last, you need to get the moisture out. Otherwise, you've got brie or camembert or, or anything else, which is lovely, but does not last very long. That's very helpful to go over that process. So now you've got your wheel. So maturing Aurelia, you were talking about how important maturing is to the 
flavor. So what are the conditions under which you mature cheese? And again, I mean, there's just so many parallels to wine. It's so crazy. You've got your product and now you've got to put it in a cellar, right? Uh, at the beginning, um, the cheese wheels are kept for three to five weeks in the cellar of the cheese dairy. Then they, they receive regular care, including salting and rubbing every day, every two days. And then the wheels are moved to the aging cellars to be mature longer. What does the rubbing do? The rubbing with the salt is a way to drill the crust of the Comté. This crust, it permits some salt to go inside the paste, but not too much because the Comté is, is a very low salt and cheese. But it also helps to drill the crust that will... Um, protect the whales all those months after. From bacteria or anything else getting in? Is that yes. what you're saying? Okay. Right, right. But keeping it possible to breast properly on the wood. So the cheese sits and matures. So what did they do? There's You mentioned spruce. So there's the spruce board. What does that do? That's part of the terroir of the region. That's why they use it. You just explained that before. But how does the terroir of the cellar affect the outcome of the cheese. You know, if you think about the bodegas in Sherry, each of them have separate flavors. A manzanilla will not be the same. Depending on its proximity to the sea, the outcome of the Sherry will be different based on the terroir of the bodega. So will each seller have its own terroir that will add to the end product, or is it more about the effineur, the cheesemaker? The Conte Herrera has um, uh, 14 uh, specialized aging Serra, and they all have different know-hows. More than the terroir, I would say, in the aging cellar, they take the terroir from before and then make it mature or ripen in good condition. And they all uh, choose the condition depending on the potential of the wheels. They know how the milk producers work. They know how the cheesemaker is transforming the milk into cheese. And so their job is to do their best to make the best cheese at the end. So they will put the wheels on spruce board because first it's a native species from the area and it really helps the cheese to breast during the long mature process. And it uh, fights uh, against humidity because hum there is a high degree of humidity in the aging cellar. And uh, spruce board is a very good for this kind of specific condition. And the wheels will have regular care during all the aging uh, process. And uh, they will go through different cave temperature depending on what kind of fermentation you want to have in the wheel. So at the beginning, they are put in a warm cellar. But when we say warm cellar, it's 14 degrees. It's not that warm. Right. It, it's, uh, for us, it's warm cellar. It permits to launch the fermentation. And then they can stay here for a few weeks and then going in colder cellar between 7 and 12 degrees, d depending on the aroma you want at the end. Okay, so the temperature will affect the aroma and flavor? Because of the fermentation process, yes. Those are choices that the cheesemaker is going to make? Yes, the affineur. The affineur. Yeah. And what about the aroma wheel that you have created that's something that's common in wine. I don't know whether that idea was adopted from wine or whether that's something that you came up with separately. How did that come about? Uh, the aroma wheels uh, appear in the 90s. Actually, it was um, a small anecdote. Our um, former president, Yves Gogli, went back one day after meeting winemakers and told them, um, around him. I want to be able to talk about my Conte as the winemaker talk about their wines. So he asked a specialist in a sensorial analysis to work on this specific aroma wheel. He wanted every milk producer, every cheesemaker, every affineur 
to be able to talk with good words about the cheese. So it really comes from the wine and we were the first to do it for cheese. And it's very, very important. We have um, different juries, tasting juries that are working on that purpose. They taste many cheeses from different fruitières. And so we are able to say that fruitière has this kind of aromatic profile. This fruitière has these other kind of aromatic profile. So we are proud to be able to define the taste of Conte and the diversity of aromas. Okay, but here's the question that I have and a lot of other people have. So in wine, we have the ability to look on a label and say we want it from a specific producer or from a specific commune in Burgundy or we want it from a specific vineyard so how do we figure out which fruitier is making the cheese? It's not on the cheese. Is there any way to do that? Or are you working on that at all? No, you have no way to know it. <laughs> That's but the only problem, com- right? <laughs> but coming, in, coming here and uh, going to taste in the different uh, cheese there is, it's always a surprise when you eat a Comte cheese. It's part of the game. So why do you think that Comte is so much more famous than the wines of the Jura? Jura really wound up having a problem in not being known and falling off the map. And Comte has had continued success, is so popular in France, is popular everywhere. And then we've got the wines of the Jura where... Only now, you know, the sommelier community has searched for high and low for anything that no one is drinking. And now they're, thank goodness, they've discovered the wines of the Jura. Is there a reason why the cheese accelerated while the wine stagnated for a long time? I think a lot of people have never had a trousseau or pulsard before or bois. I would say that the major difference between them is their area. The Jura vineyard uh, don't cover a large area, whether Comte cheese uh, is produced in three departments. It's the first PDO cheese in terms of production volume. So I think that uh, that permits us to promote Comte mainly in France, but also abroad. And uh, maybe another thing that keeps Jura wines here is that we like them so much that we don't want to share them (laughs) with you. (laughs) It's good that the wine has gotten out. What about the food pairings with Jura? Do you drink the local wines with Comte or do you have other things with it? Jura wines and Comte is a perfect match. They are from the same terroir. They are on the same aromatic profile. The king pairing would be a yellow wine, le vin jaune. Yes, vin jaune. With, with an aged Comté. That's the, the perfect thing. Typically, Comté goes well with every Jura wine. It goes also well with other wine from other regions. We like Comté with white wines. It goes well with red as well, but light red, it's perfect with white. Yeah, and there's a lot of light reds in the Jura as well, so I can see that that goes very well. So the grading bands, oh my gosh, I had no idea that there was a difference between the green and the brown band. So can you tell us about the classification system of the cheese, the the brown versus the green band? Mm Mm-hmm. Before selling the Comté, each wheel is graded. We have some points for the taste. We have some points for the presentation. Taking account all of that, a wheel that will have a minimum of 14 will be uh, affixed with a green label, a green logo uh, Comté. If the wheel obtain a note between... um, 12 and 14, it will be a brown label. And if it doesn't get uh, the note of 12, it can't be a Comté. It's uh, declassified and uh, it's not a Comté anymore. Yeah, then what is it called? What do you do with that? It can be used for 
melting cheese in industry, but they cannot say it's Conte. Got it. So when we look at something to purchase, besides looking at the green and brown band, because the way that it gets sliced up, sometimes you can't even see that. Is there something we should look for in the cheese when we're looking for the best slice? I mean, how do we make sure that what we're getting is the best if we're looking at pre-sliced Comte, which is how a lot of it comes here in the U.S.? You have to make sure it has a good presentation. You can look at the color of the paste if you want to have information on the cheese. If the um, cheese is more yellow, it means that the Comté has been produced in summer when the cows were outside. And if the paste is like ivory, it means that uh, the Comté has been made in winter when cows were eating hay. Interesting. That can be, that. that's a tip to choose your Comté. You can look at the crust. The crust has to be nice. Do you mean like it should be thick when you say it's nice, like what should we be looking at? The appearance of the crust with also depends on the edge of the cheese. So the more edged the Conte is, the bigger the crust will be. Got it. But it should be dry. It shouldn't be uh, with a lot of humidity to be kept longer. So once we open it, what do we do with it to make sure that we don't ruin it in our fridge? I'll be honest, a lot of times we just eat the whole thing. But if we don't eat it all at once, what's the best way to preserve Comte in the refrigerator? In the refrigerator, you should put the slice in cheese paper or waxed paper. Mm -hmm. And um, you have to think about uh, getting it out of the fridge uh, maybe 30 minutes before eating it. Because it'll ruin the aromas if it's too cold, like wine. Yes. Just like wine. Right. Yeah, very similar world that we inhabit. So if people come to the region, they can tour the House of Comte. Are there food and wine experiences that people can have there or elsewhere in the Jura? Actually, we have a tourism program called Les Routes du Comté. And Les Routes du Comté can propose you visits to farm, to fritière. You can visit an aging cellar if you want to discover more about the maturing process. And on the Route du Comté, you'll also have some cheese museum. You'll have restaurants, place to sleep in the nature. Uh, this is a very good program to discover the area. That's so great. It's one of the bigger challenges is traveling in France and knowing where you can go and where you can't go. And wine is the producers oftentimes don't want you to come in and things like that. So it's nice to know that there could be experiences where you could do both cheese and probably experience some wine along the way too. My last question is about climate change because we in wine have experienced so many changes due to climate change and there is some concern about especially cows and their impact on the environment, people moving towards vegetarian diets, and the rennet that you use is from cow stomachs. So there are people that are now breeding cheeses from local fungi, which I don't think you would ever do, but there are some rennets made from from plants, from plant-based foods, which would reduce some of the impact with the cows. Is there ever a chance that that would be a change in the PDO or would that continue just as people start to think about changes to the environment and impact? Uh, there are um, several questions in what you I know. say. <laughs> <laughs> thought I'd give it to you all at once. I, I would say um, uh, climate change is a big issue for us in the next years because we used to have a lot of rain uh, which was good for the, the growing of the grass. And it's been uh, uh, several years that we were affected by a big drought during uh, the summer. The milk producers have to adapt when there is not enough grass at one moment to protect the cows and a benefit to the animal welfare, they give hay and the milk production is uh, decreasing 
during these times. But as soon as the autumn arrive, the rain get back and the cows could be outside longer. And so the milk production was going again enough for what we need. So I would say it's an adaptation to the climate. We are a product that work with nature and we have to uh, do with that. We have to adapt to the nature. We don't want to change it. And as for the, the rennet, the rennet actually is, a, is an ingredient that has been used from the very beginning of the cheese making. And as we talk about a, a PDO cheeses that uh, respect the tradition Actually, we keep the rennet in the transformation. We, we don't think right now at changing the rennet for uh, something else. Due to the, the rennet is part of the Conte specification. And um, we'll, we'll see later, but not now. Again, we're just constantly, Jean-Louis was saying this as well, we're always having to make these adaptations. Now we're seeing it, I think, faster because we are dealing directly with the plant in wine. So even in Champagne, which one of the coolest regions, we're having to make big changes based on both the environment and the fact that, you know, the consumer wants certain things. I think we're going to see big bottling changes come through wine very soon. So it's just an interesting thing to think about. I think we're getting, maybe we're getting more pressure from consumers to really make a change in wine. Most people are moving away from animal-based ingredients to filter wine and things like that as a result of, you know, people asking these questions. So I just wanted to know if that had been on your mind. Well, this is so interesting. I think that there's just so many parallels between cheese and wine that I had never really considered. Jean-Louis, do you have anything else you want to say? Well, as you said, I mean, there are a ton of similarities. I mean, in some ways you could say it's all about microorganisms and it's all about fermentation and all these good things that are very fabulous processes. And, you, you know, I think the best results are obtained where the producers respect uh, all these elements that come from nature. And ultimately, this is what Conte is, is all about. It's an expression of a specific region, the Massif du Jura. It's also very involved in its environment, in protecting and ma maintaining the environment. You know, so there are, also, there are many positive um, aspects vis-à-vis -vis the environment in the production of Conte. It's a very extensive model and so on. So there's so much that could be said. With wine, again, the matter of it's not about producing more and more quantities of, of mediocre wine. It's about producing less of a quality wine. And I think in that sense, it, it's another similarity. Yeah. Cheese production and cheese eating has gone up. I saw some crazy statistic about how much more cheese people are eating and people are drinking less wine and higher quality. I wonder if cheese at some point will hit that reckoning too. Certainly, there'll always be a market for cheeses like Comte because they are in a class of their own. There's just nothing like it. I think the exciting thing is we've really made big progress in terms of the American interest in cheeses, the fact that we've got access to these cheeses now. I know you want to keep them to yourself, but we appreciate you exporting a little bit to us. And the interest levels then in things like visiting the region, learning more about it. You know, we do this through wine, but it can also be done through cheeses. So I think if you're looking to do wine travel before you go, look also at what the cheese scene looks like in these specific areas, because it can be very rich, especially in France. I think bringing it at the attention that it's not just about going to Jura and only tasting Arbois and, you know, Van Jean and Van de Pie. It's, it's different, right? There's other things that you can look at too. And it's really quite interesting to look at all of it together. Yeah. And I would say another similarity that we haven't talked about is the fact that we can only encourage the consumers to find good wine stores and good cheese stores where they can speak to someone who knows what they are are selling to them and can provide some guidance. And certainly a podcast like yours is fantastic because it helps consumers understand much more about wine and now about cheese. And that's what we're trying to do is help the consumers become more discerning, more knowledgeable and figure things out for themselves. Absolutely. Well, this was so great. Thank you both so much for your time. This is fantastic. It's so 
interesting for me to get my head out of all wine all the time and into a different world. So I will have to come and visit and look at all of the fruitiers as well. I'm in love with Comte also, but I loved some of the tips also in shopping and storing and things like that. So I'm going to have to get some more cheese paper. I can see that now. All right. Well, (laughs) thank you both so much. And with that, this has been another episode of Wine for Normal People. Thank you so much for listening and we will catch you next time.